All right. I wanted to congratulate everyone to making it to the last week. Um, just to recap, we have a smart book assignment due in the last week. We have a homework assignment due in the last week, as well as a final exam. So please start on the work early in the week to give yourself ample time to finish everything that is required um, and finish the course strong. All right, so in this video, I am just gonna show a couple of the homework problems like we've been doing and the exam is completely on to you. Remember you are allowed two attempts um, to the final exam. And so, and you, there's, I posted some more about the final exam in the announcement, so please read through that. And again, do not wait till the last day to give yourself time to retake it if you want to retake it, all right? But make sure you do all three of these assignments in the last week, smart book, homework, and final. So if we go into our homework here. Yeah. So you can see these are problems that we've done before, um, but we're gonna now kind of take it a step further based on the central limit theorem, right? Um, and so when we solve these problems, we'll continue to use uh, technology or the tables to solve the problems that we are working on. So concerns about climate change and CO2 reduction have initiated the commercial production uh, of blends of biodiesels. Random samples of 64 blended fuels are tested in a lab to ascertain the bio slash total carbon ratio. The so true mean is 9,400. The standard deviation is 0.03. Within the interval, will 90% of the sample means fall? Right, and so the key here is remembering um, that we have to create a new standard deviation based on our samples, which are what we're talking about here in part B, right? So the interval here, bring up our XL, bring up our pen, right? So we're doing intervals. True mean is 94, is 9.94, an interval of 90% of the sample means fall. So, oh, I have to draw my picture. So the, again, this is 0 0.90, right? And then our mean is here in the middle of 0.94. Our standard deviation is 0.003. And we're trying to work our way backwards. So if this is 90%, 10% of the tails, just like we were doing last week. So this is 5%, so 0 0.05. And now, because we are taking 46 samples, I have to divide my standard deviation by the square root of 46 because of the central limit theorem. Central limit theorem says I take my standard deviation and I divide it by the square root of how many I am picking. So um, I can calculate it individually or I can just let Excel do all the work for me. So again, doing norm inverse because we're working backwards. My probability for my lower number is going to be 0.05. My mean is uh, 0.94. My standard deviation is 0 0.003 divided by the square root of 46. And my first answer should be 0 0.93. How many decimal four paces? 9393. Nine, so 0.9393. And then to find the other one, because I, again, Excel, just like the tables reach the left, if I'm doing the far right value, I have to add 90 and five together. So then I just change this thing to 0 0.95 and I get 9407. So 0 0.9407. Amazing, the central limit theorem says, um, I'll be approximately normal with a mean, I know they're getting picky. I like the word approximately, let's see what's it. I'm gonna go approximately normal with a mean of 0.94 and the standard deviation of this. So if the true mean is this, what is the sample in 
distribution of x bar? And the answer should be four. Yeah, it's approximately normal. Uh, what theorem do we just use? Our lovely friend, the central limit theorem. Oh. So clear my pretty drawing, because you can see I'm still drawing pictures here. It has helped me under clearly see the problem, because this is the wording, and I, I, I don't write these problems, so sometimes they get me as well. Just read through them, draw your picture, and kind of see. Find the standard error of the mean of a sampling distribution, right? So standard error is just what we just did a minute ago, the standard deviation divided by the square root of n. So like the first one would be 60 divided by the square root of nine, which is three. So 60 divided by three is 20. So that one is just 20, All right? So again, the key formula for standard error or finding the new standard deviation, as I like to call it, is you take the population standard deviation and you divide it by the square root of the sample size. Gives you your standard error or the standard deviation of the sample mean. That is the formula you need for one, applying the central limit theorem. And again, I have videos and announcements and the theory behind it. So if you're still a little fuzzy on that, you reach out to me, post a discussion, um, or read over the, that information. Um, so again, find the standard error and then recalculate. So a lot of these are gonna be very similar to a lot of week six's homework. I mean, there was no homework in week seven. You know, find a new standard deviation to keep using the things we are doing. Um, all right, so now we want to find a confidence interval, right? So to find a confidence interval, what we're going to do is, again, we draw a picture. And what we're trying to do is figure out what the true mean is, the population mean, right? And we don't know it, but we're gonna use the sample data to find it. So if we use the sampling information for our confidence interval formulas, we have to find, use the formula, which is to find the lower is X bar minus um, Z alpha, Oops, alpha over two. And that's an ugly looking alpha. It's supposed to look more like a fish than an eight. So I can draw that again with my mouse. Alpha, there we go. This is a called our critical value. And we're going to multiply that by the square uh, standard deviation divided by the square root of n. And then to find our upper limit, we just do the exact same thing again, except for we will add. So subtract gives me the lower, add gives me the upper. So again, if we go to Excel, and you can find these in pieces. So I can do equals um, to find the critical value, to find the Z alpha over two, this is called the critical value. Can't type today. That's the Z alpha over two, right? So what you wanna do is you do norm equals norms dot dist with the S, norms.s.dist. And no, sorry, not S, no, inverse, we want the inverse. And again, just like we were doing before, if we have a 90% confidence interval, then that means there's 5% in each tail, right? And because it's symmetric, this value and this value are exactly the same. One is just negative, one is just positive because I put the S in, which means it's centered at a zero, right? So what I do here is I just have to do it once. So I do norms.s.inverse with a probability of 5% and I get negative 1.645, right? Um, but I just always use the positive because where the negative comes into play is when I do the subtraction. So to find my lower, I take my X bar, which is, we'll put an equal sign, which is 43. I then subtract my critical value. So 1.6 or five, I rounded. Um, and I multiply that by my standard error. So times three divided by the square root of, 11, right? 
is 41. And then to find my upper, I'm going to be lazy. I'm going to copy this. And I'm going to paste it right below. And I'm just going to change that minus to a plus. And call this my upper. All right, because all I'm going to do is take, again, the, the sample mean, 43, plus my critical value times standard deviation divided by the square root of n. And so I get my answers. Try to bring up both this time since get my answers of 41.5120. I want four decimal places. And my other one is 44.48796, so eight zero. And then to do it again, notice all I have to do is find a different confidence L. So I really just gotta go here to my critical value. If I do 95%, that's 95 in the middle, then two and a half, five percent in the tails divided by two is two and a half percent. So I just change this to two and a half, get 1.96, and then do it again for 99. Right. And you just kind of keep doing that over and over again for the difference. And you'll notice a pattern on um how I, what happens as I change my confidence interval sizes, but that's how you can use technology. All right, here's another confidence interval. Just like we just did before. And all right, so here's a different one, all right? So if you click on Appendix D, this is the table for student T, right? Which Again, if you want to use, you can look at the formulas I've posted. I mean, the videos are posted other, on other parts of the course page. But again, we can just use technology, right? So doing the same thing I did before, the formula is basically the same, except for I got to find a T critical value instead of a Z critical value, right? So critical value. Ignore my extra V I typed in there. I'm going to hit enter, right? So just like we did before, but now instead of a T Z or norms inverse, we're going to do a T inverse and we're going to do a T inverse two tail because it's a confidence interval. And so it wants our probability. It wants the alpha, right? So if I have a 98% confidence interval, that means I have 2% in the tails. So this is 0.02. And then my degrees of freedom is my sample size minus one. So I have a sample size of 28. So then I put in 27. And that gives me my critical value. And then I do the same thing as I did before. Lower, upper. My lower, again, is still my X bar, which in this case is 900. I subtract my critical value. I multiply it by my standard deviation. And I divide it by the square root of my sample size, which is 228. So the only difference between when you know the population standard deviation of sigma, sorry, when you know the population standard deviation of sorry, standard deviation sigma, use the Z. If you have the sample standard deviation S, then you use the T. So the only difference is finding critical values. One uses norms one uses T inverse, right? So I, again, bring that down. Again, I can be lazy and just copy my formula and paste it and change it to a plus. And now I have my lower and upper limit again. So three decimal places this time. So 895.327 and 904.6729 becomes a three. And there you go. So very similar to question four. Do it all. You'll see something different as the intervals change. You'll notice. Um, and this one is based on sample size. So the interval is the same, same. Sorry, the 98, 98. But what is changing is the standard deviation. So how does standard deviation affect it? So I'll let you work those out. All right. So we have an Excel file now. So we can close this. Don't save. So to open it up in Excel, you click on the little link. It downloads the pharmacy data here. And now you can see um, we have all our data from our thing. 
And what you can do is you want to find a 90% and you have no mean and you have no standard deviation. So we have to go back a couple lessons here, right? So this is a good review for the final. To find the mean of something, I type in an Excel. No, oh, I need to let it in. Type in, so I gotta find the mean. I need to find the standard deviation. Let's type in standard. So to find the mean, it is equals average. And then I highlight my data. And then to find the standard deviation equals standard STDEV of the sample. Remember that, highlight my data. And then because I have a sample standard deviation, I need to find a T critical value. That's like we've been doing. So I do equals T inverse two tail. And it's asking for a 90% confidence interval. So that means my area outside the 90% is 10%. Oops, one zero. Comma, my degrees of freedom, there's 16. Right here it says N as well as over here. So that means my degrees of freedom is 15. And then I just take this mean, so to find my lower, equals the mean minus the critical value times standard deviation divided by the square root of my sample size, which is 16. And there is my lower of 16.13. Once four decimal places, but I'm assuming Excel rounded okay. It did. And then you do it again with an add. Okay. So for this question, we're going over to now 8.6 confidence intervals of the proportion, right? Um, and I look at this is what I like to call the sample proportion, right? So we have a new standard central limit standard error formula for proportions. So we take the proportion times it by its complement and divide by, again, our sample size. The key, right, um, is scrolling through here. So this table is very useful where it tells you how big your sample is, what your proportion should, sample proportion should be. Um, or what you can do is um, check, you know, these and make sure that you are done, get the, or bigger than 10 when you multiply them together. So your proportion times uh, your N gives you a good success and then your proportion times your fail is greater than 10 or you can just use the table, right? So for like this first one, our N is 29. So it's right here between 25 and 33. Our proportion should be 0.4 to 0.6 or 0.3 to 0.7 somewhere in that range and we're at 0.2. So this is definitely a no already, right? So that's how you use the table. Now to find the standard error, I'm gonna use Excel to type in our, this formula here, right? So I already got my symbols put in so you can see where I'm getting my numbers from. So the value is 0.2, so this is 0.2. To find its complement, I just put in equals one minus that previous answer. And then my sample size is 29. And now I can find my standard error based off my proportion by putting in an equal sign, square root of sample proportion times its complement divided by sample size. And I get 0 0.0743, so 0 0.0, oops. 0 0.0743, and that's good. So basically, again, go to your books, 8.6, or go to the announcement. There's a standard error formula, a nice little table that you can use, or you can just do the calculations yourself based on the rule of thumb. Um, nine, again, is just using the table and asking, are these safe to call normal? And then our final question is doing the confidence interval formula which is right here. I take the proportion and I times it by Z alpha over two square root of, and notice in the little table here, they give you the ones that we already learned how to calculate earlier. We're back to Z, so it's the norms, norm dot S dot inverse. But again, 
we can either calculate it or you can see there's our 1.645, our 1.96, and our 2.576. I think it's just problem four that we did earlier. So we know again that our we're doing a 90% confidence interval. So you can use either Excel or now that we know it, we know it's 1.645. So my critical value, my Z critical value for a 90% confidence interval is always going to be 1.645. Five. Only the T changes because it's based off degrees of freedom, right? And so now I can take um, my X, which is 17, my N, which is 54. So to find my P hat or sample proportion, right? I, I always like to call it P hat because that's what most statistics books call it. Uh, is just, oops, forgot to put my equal sign in, x divided by n, so it's 0 0.315. So I can move this over here for just a minute. And so we're going to take our p times it by 1.645 and then do our standard error formula, which we just did a minute ago. And then when we subtract, that's our lower, we add, that is our upper. So formulas are very similar for confidence intervals. What's the difference is, is the standard error formula is different um, as well as what critical value you get. But the concept that we add is subtract those things, which our book doesn't mention it, but it's called margin of error. Um, because of the margin of error, then we are going to actually uh, take basically our sample portion or sample statistic, either X bar or P here. And then we're gonna add and subtract our margin of error, which is always these calculations that we've been doing. So there's some review again for this assignment. Again, make sure you complete your final this week and message me if you have any questions.